Dear friends, welcome to this webinar on transportation. And we'll be focusing on management practices. Now, this program has been developed in cooperation with CII Institute for Logistics to cater to the need of the senior officials managing the transportation. Now, broadly, when we say management practices, it refers to working methods and innovation that managers use to improve the effectiveness of the work systems. Common practices when we talk around includes organization relationship, the leadership, the decision making, employee relationship, effective communication, training and development. Now keeping in this mind, let's walk through the learning objectives. The learning objectives for today's session is First thing is to understand what is meant by management. Because we are talking about management practices, it's good to know what is management and what is organization. Next, next what we're going to talk about is the different style of relationship, types of relationship in organizations. Is it a formal, is it informal? Or is it a flat organization? Or is it a very tall organization with multi-layer of hierarchies? The role of a leader? What type of leader it is? Is it autocratic type? Is it a benevolent type? So different types of styles around we talk about. The decision making process, how the manager or the leader makes the decisions around. Is it based on facts or is it based on the input given by the people or is it a combination of both? The next issue comes up is dealing with disciplinary issues. Obviously, when you're dealing with masses, you're dealing with people. There are bound to be issues around. There could be problems, there could be grievances. How do you deal with them? And the next is when you're dealing with them, it calls for communications. How is your communication? Is it effective or efficient or not? Lastly, but not the least, is also important around the technology is changing, organizations are changing, there's a change all around. To cater to that need, to improve the skill of the people around, are we focusing on training and development? So this is broadly in the next 60 minutes we'd like to cover on. So the broad objective, when I summarize it, is to understand an overview of management practices in a particular transport organization, that is relationships, structures, relationship, and lastly, the staff development. Let's start with the very first one. What is management? When you become the managers or you are dealing with the management activities around, you have resources. The resources could be in terms of men, materials, people. How do we use effectively them? And to do what they want to do. You have organization goals. The goals are coming from the vision, mission. And then based on that, you're developing your goals. So in short, it is basically how you manage the resources to achieve or to meet the goals. This gives you again another summary that management is nothing but a process. Keep in mind, it's a process designed to achieve an organization objectives by using its resources effectively and efficiently. The last line you have to keep in mind is changing environment. So the process, what you have been doing, let's say four years back, and four or five years back, new, in the time to go, the technology has changed, the people have changed. So you need changing environment is there. Around. The competition is also changing. So you need to change your management style as well. Now next comes what managers do around. Now if you look around when the managers make decisions, obviously they're utilizing the resources of the organizations and they have objective to achieve. Behind all this, what they do? The first thing is always planning, planning, planning. That's a key thing. Anything we do around is to plan first what they are going to do to achieve the objectives. Then obviously when they have the target, they have the goal, they have the objectives, they need organization. Then they say, guys, let me organize how I'm going to work, how my structure will look like, how I'm going to staff it, how many people I need, what type of skills I need. Then once you know what type of skills and the people you need, you need to direct them on a daily basis or on a monthly or weekly basis. And lastly, but not the least, is the controlling part. 
you have fixed the target, you have fixed the requirements, how are they meeting with it? So that's what we're talking about, the controlling part. So the broadly in a graphical form, if I had to show, planning is the very beginning, organizing is the next, coordinating, staffing, the next pillar becomes directing and controlling, and last pillar is, I would say, very important around, the way you made a decision, was it good or bad, will know from the evaluation. So when you evaluate your process, at least then you know, well, guys, this is not the way I should do it. You revise your plans. So this is the way the management process goes on. This again talks about the management process, but linking up different functions, the management functions, the management skills, what are exactly required around. When do you need technical skills? When do you need human communication skills? When do you need conceptual skill? So this gives you under what pillar, what activity, what skills are required around. Next comes managing the structures. Now, so naturally you've planned it, now you want to make a structure part. Okay, how do I want to operate? So this is what you're trying to show how your business is going to be structured, how the communication will be passed on from top to bottom. So this is where the gives you some graphical ideas. The internal, the formal framework of a business that shows the way in which management is organized and how the authority is passed on through the organization. How does it move? You want to make some changes, you want to implement new technologies, you want to bring new ideas, you want to change the processes. How do you communicate down the line? So this gives you a broad idea about the characteristics. So this is the way typical organization structure where you have a height. More the height, that means the organization is taller. In sense, there are more hierarchical levels. More the levels, the gap between the top and the bottom becomes big. There's a communication gap. And if the height is less, it's more of a flat organization. So communication goes much faster. It doesn't get twisted, it doesn't get distorted. Then the next point is about the span of a control. How many people are reporting to X or Y supervisors? If it is eight or nine, the way it is shown here, the span of a control is much wider. Are you able to effectively communicate? And if you're dealing in a white collar job, span of control may be shorter. While in the case, it's a blue collar job, in a production job, you may have a longer span of control. Another thing come is the departmentations. In this typical st structures, you try to department everything around. Departmentalizations, guys, okay, this is the finance function. This is the group of people dealing with finance. Here's a group of people dealing with R&D. Here's a group of people dealing with marketing. Here's a group of people dealing with HR. So you basically create departments. And the people who are in that department, they are of the same, same background and they are able to understand them each other is much better. Any typical organization, we always say there are broadly three levels. It's the top levels, which we call C level, the middle managers who carry out the decision given by the top management, and operations people who are daily on a daily basis taking care of those objectives, outputs. That's what they do. Now, when we say the structure part, now which factors goes into it? The broadly, I would say, obviously, the organization environment, what type of organization it is. I've seen many organizations which are manufacturing, they want to be very pyramid type. If it is a basically IT and technology, they want to be very flatters. So what type of environment it is, it makes a big difference. The next question comes up is the technology part. What type of technology is being used around? If in a manufacturing company, I'm using robots, I'm using IoT, it needs a different type of structure. But if it is totally human intensives, machine intensive, it's a different type of technology. So in those cases, my structure would be totally different. The next is human resources. The staff which I'm hiring, they're very well trained, they're very well qualified. Each one is specialist in their own areas. The structure would be different. Let's say I've got a legal unit, one guy is dealing with intellectual property rights 
other one is dealing with criminal issues, third one is dealing with other things around. So each one is very specialized. So when people are specialized, you need a different type of structure. Lastly, but not the least, is strategy. What exactly you want? Do you want people to interact together? Or do you want people to work in silos? How the results are coming around? Is the results are coming with interaction among them? Or it has come independently from each one? So that strategy also makes a big difference in the way of structures. Other characteristics which are also important is do you want this to be centralized? When I say centralized, I mean all the decisions are made at the top. Any change has to come, it has to come from the top to bottom. So that's the way that means it is all the time top to bottom, not bottom down. Up. So if you want bottom up, then you have to think of a decentralization. So the people down the line can also pass on the information to the top. Standardization, that means you have developed, and particularly this happens with centralization. People have developed their standard operating procedures, set guidelines, set procedures, press step one, step two, step three, like this step one to three. So in that process, everything has been streamlined. I can understand around for big organizations, complex organizations, they don't want everybody doing their own way. You want something consistency. And when you want a consistency, you need to look around the standardization. Specialization, as I said in the beginning, in the previous slide, and last is formalization. Do you want structure to be very formal? If people have to go to the big boss, do they have to go through the layers? Or can they straight approach to anybody? I mean, in today's generation, I think the formality part is slowly dying off. People are able to connect each other. People are able to talk to each other and communicate their feelings around. Here comes the formal structures. This indicates who has the overall responsibility. You know, in the, in the bottom, you can see around the biggest box, that guy has got the biggest responsibility of decision making. Down the line is all action people, but the responsibility lies with the one guy who makes all the decisions, how things will look like, how things will be done. So that's where it is there. Around. Another thing comes up is relationship between people working on foreign organizations. How authority is passed down, the chain of command, the number of subordinates reporting to the manager, the span of control, the channels of communication, identifying workers, supervisors, and managers. Everybody knows who I'm accountable. So that accountability is also very clear who is going to make my career path around. So that's why they are linked in that. Now, in this case, when we talk of a formality, advantages are very clear. Power starts at the top and works down. So very clear around, no confusion. Everything is no ambiguity around. And divisions can be based on departments, geographic reasons, product category. The level of promotions are clear for employees. They know how I have to go up the path. The role of each employee is clear. These are the ones which you find very often in the public sector, the government sectors, are very big companies, very complex companies, which are also somewhat bureaucratic. But those which are startups, which are the really moving into technology, you won't find this type of structures on this one. The disadvantage, as I said earlier, the top to bottom communication is very typical, not usually efficient. The top people don't know what are the problem at the ground level. So it's totally cut off from that angle around. And horizontal communication is totally limited. Everybody says, oh, I'm from finance, I'm from procurement, I'm from supply chain. They don't even pass on the communication to each other because at the end of the day, the customer is connected with all of them, but they get the distorted information from each department. Around. Very inflexible, that's what the disadvantage is there around. Here comes the informal structures, which is very popular with the small businesses and particularly with the startups. All the startups are basically informal. The decisions are done on the spot. They are not waiting at the end of the day that somebody from the top will give them the decisions around. Here comes when we are doing function by 
function, we say, guys, okay, this is a marketing function. This is an HR function. We try to divide the job around. So people of one function are clubbed together. Now, advantage is obviously is that if I'm in a finance and my all colleagues are from finance, I'm learning from each other. And everybody knows I'm going to step on each other's job in due course. Easy for managers to monitor and evaluate workers, allow managers to scan, monitor, and obtain information. The disadvantage is, again, a silo mentality. Today's functions, when I look around, you need a knowledge skill set of each one. Even if I'm in a supply chain, I need to know what finance is doing around, what marketing, what r and I need to interact with them. So that interaction is required, which misses in this one. Centralized versus decentralized. I think this game has been going for a long time. And if I look back, when I started my career around, everything used to be centralized. All the decisions are made at one level. But then the concept came, the companies were growing in big size. Everybody said, guys, oh, everyone is waiting for the decision from the top to come for that. So they gave it, particularly those which are multi organizations, multi companies around, multi sites around. They said, guys, okay, each site can make their own decision. So it became very decentralized. But now, when I look from the procurement context around, they say, guys, if each unit is making their own decisions, while the items and the goods which are being bought are common among all of them, can we think of a volume leverage? Like when I look around you and we had 200 country offices around, each one was doing their own procurements. Each res rep is taking their own decisions around. But now later on, somebody thinks, guys, items are common for all of them. Why can't we leverage them? Why can't we make a long-term arrangement for all of them? So then we have a combination of centralized versus decentralized. Same thing I see in many of the top companies around in the private sectors, which are MNCs. Hey guys, okay, we spend 40%, 50% of our spend on procurement and supply chain. Can we get the leverage of all that instead of decentralizing? So I see that sourcing, the strategic sourcing is done at the headquarters, while the transaction sourcing is done at the country level. So this is how the model is changing around. Now comes again the organization structures, pre-bureaucratic structures. We all know, which is again very small informal structures. Next one come the bureaucratic structures. I mean the companies have become bigger and bigger and complexity has gone and they want they want standardizations around. So they became typical structures with the tall structures with more hierarchies. Functional structures. So this is again based on the Again, suited for standardized goods and services, large volumes and low cost. Around. That means each is a function part. Division structures, particularly when you're dealing with multi products around. Look at Hindustan Legal. Look at any other FMCG companies around. Okay, one group is dealing with, let's say, vegetable group is a separate division around. One is dealing with beauty products, is a separate one around. One is dealing with electronic item, is a separate division around. So they each one may have their own finance department, but they have divisions covering each product group around. Matrix has become very, very popular in the past, particularly when we are dealing with the projects around. I have a one project of infrastructures in X place. I get I need a team of people from finance. I need a team from, again, from procurement, supply chain. So we put people together to finish that project. When the project is over, everybody goes back to their own circle. Then they again club together into the next project. So that's the way it's a matrix structures. I mean, the next slide will show you a better idea about it. So we have people from finance, people from production, people from marketing, people from human resource, R&D. So there's a project team covering all this together. But once the project is over, then the next project when I'm at allotted, I may have a different team members with me. So in the process, and you find that quite a lot of people in IT business are technology people who are working on the projects, 
once the project is over, next time they may have a different team itself with whom they work. So this is a great support around them. Now this gives us advantages and disadvantages of this matrix around them. Now the advantage is obviously the flexibility in adopting to change. That means today I'm doing a project for one company. Let's say I'm doing a project for General Motors. Tomorrow I'm finish this project. The next time I'm doing for Suzuki. The third time I'm doing for Hondas. So each client I'm doing a project. I have a flexibility in adopting to changes. And you learn a lot. Instead of doing the same thing repetitively, you're doing for 20 clients at a different time. So you become very flexible. You learn also a lot. Focus on major problems or products. Outlet for employees creativity. And the employees also become creative. This is the solution I gave it to this company. I changed the solution. I gave it to this company. Then they're very flexible. There. But the challenge comes you integrating your skills of many specialists into a coordinated team. Because every time you have a different team, and the team is very important to us. And if teams are not able to work together, they don't like each other. So team is not very well built. So that is a big challenge. So the who is the team leader makes a big meaning around how is that person able to integrate them? Maybe for a project of six months, they have to integrate them together. Employees frustrations, confusion over reporting to two bosses. Because they know very well I'm coming from this department, but I'm working for this project. So two people are going to make my appraisal at the end of the year. One, my own boss, and second, with whom I'm working as a team, who's the team leader. So this is where the challenge is there in this game. Now the world is changing into the more in the virtual world. They say, guys, why should we have thousands of people around? We're becoming a boundaryless organization. So we have a core team. And then we have people all over the world, maybe, or maybe all over the country, who are part of you, who are connected with you. And they report to you all virtually. So basically, you're using the internet for networking. So you have a networking. Let's say if I've got an office in one country, in one city, but in other cities around, I don't want to have a burden of extra cost in offices. I hire people around who will be reporting to me virtually, whatever business they bring. So it's all, if any issues they need, they, connect, they need some approvals. Everything can be done on a virtual basis. So it's a virtual network using to a lot extent on the internet. I think this works a lot. Now question comes, okay, I have set the organization, but this is not set in stone. When our skills or requirements are changing, how can organization structures remain set in stone? Now people are better qualified nowadays. New skills are required around. Now there are a lot of local factors which has to be looked into it. I suppose this MNC. They may have a different structure in US, but when they're working in India or in other Asian country, they may have to look into the local factor also. The structure may not be exactly the same replica what is done in the headquarters. Communication is quicker and faster. And today's organization need leaders and team efforts around. There's another type of organization you will find the committee organization. I think these are the more common in the government sector, in the United Nations. I would say also in here what happens around is the heads of the departments are given some authority level. But more than that, authority in terms of spending or managing the resources, a committee is formed around. They say, guys, oh, this spend is up to this amount, you guys can take care. Now, this spend is more than your authority level. A committee will sit together and they'll make a decision. You want to hire a very senior person? Instead of the head of the department making a loan decision, a team will be sitting around and then the team will make a decision. So it's all about committees who take the decisions around. In the UN, it is very common and the government also is very common. And a bill has to be cleared by the political parties. Again, the committee forms around. So it's all about committees. So technically in the committees, different thoughts are taken from different departments, different functions, and then the results are taken around. 
same thing could have been done without committees if i am heading one function if i need some advice i could do on a very informal basis go to finance what do you feel about it are you okay with this other one is that we form a committee and there's a chairperson of the committee who makes a decision now the factors of the structures whatever we had discussed so far let me summarize it again on this the size of the business is very important around is it very big is it multinationals or it is only one city or many or within the country many places around all those factor counts around the style of the leadership what type of leader we have it makes a big difference one leader they want to manage by walking around they want to go around and meet people talk to them listen to them they manage that way there are other managers who want to sit in one office everything they want on the table and they want to make a decision on that basis around so each one the style of a leadership comes in on reducing overhead costs do you want to cut down the overheads that means you want to flatten the organization so so all that factor makes a big difference i remember those days when we used to have for each manager a separate cabin around now people say guy the rents are going so high can i remove this all around let everybody be in the open let people communicate faster instead of going through the cabins around so that culture also we have seen and obviously that cuts down the cost corporate objectives what we want to achieve around new technologies can make it current type obsolete also if we are getting the new technologies you look at the manufacturing lot of robotics are being used around in production in service industry also a lot of ai is are coming into this iot is are coming into this so in short when we are coming with those type of technologies the old structure cannot work so we may have to make changes into the organization structure as well next thing comes once you have understood what type of organization is the next comes leadership the style of leadership because at the end of the day they are the one who make the decision on what type of structure it should be now broadly let's understand around what do we expect from the leader the person who is able to influence people so that they will strive willingly towards the achievement of the group goal there is a group goal it is not the individual goal any function in any office around one alone person cannot do everything around you need wide range of skill some may have a technical skill some may have a writing skill some may have other skill we need to club them together to come with a result so it's a basically a group goals there are individual goals but technically when it comes from the organization it's a group goals so how are you able to influence the people how are you able to communicate them so they work as a much more cohesive team now importance of the leaders People say, why do we need a leader? Or oh, we know everything ourselves. Sixty percent of the jobs people can do without a leader. That's very clear, based on the study. But extra forty percent, if you want to extract from the staff, the leader counts a lot. The leader is able to give them the direction, able to put them together, and help them to make further improvements. So leader contributes a lot in anything around. The leader could be for a country. The leader could be for a company. The leader could be for a department. Wherever you think around, the leader goes a long way. The next question come all the time. We have managers. We have leaders. It is the same thing. It is the different. So look at the managers first. Obviously, you have been given the resources. You have been given the goals. and you are just following the guidelines of the company to some extent i would call the managers are there to just comply with the guidelines so these are my targets this is what i have to achieve and they have to be completed at the end of the year while the leaders go one step forward the leaders can question also why i am doing this can i do in a different way so they go into many times into why i am doing this and how i can do while in the case of manager they basically comply the path guys okay this has to be done this has to be achieved now the leadership is the ability to direct and inspire people manager may not be that much worried about the inspiring part is our huge concern is to get the job done 
So if I look at a very typical manager type, they will say my job has to be done. While the other case, the leader will look into much bigger picture. They'll look into the job. They will also look around how the job has been done. How has been done is also important. Now the, the common among leaders when they look around the three traits, I would say empathy, understanding the feelings of others, understanding the concerns of others, self-awareness. The guy is aware of all these things around. Objectivity is also involved, not the subjectivity part. When you're dealing with others, when you're dealing with masses, when you're dealing with people, when you're dealing with staff, objectivity is also important around. So the question which is again there, the managers ask how and when, whereas leader ask what and why. The managers are only particular about how it has to be done, when it has to be done, when is the date and time. While the leader will also ask, what is to be done, guys? Okay, this has to be done. And why it has to be done, then according to that, they make a decision. Because when they know the purpose of it, the why part of it, they can work backward to achieve it, improve it. That's good. Coming back to the leadership style, here you can see a very popular book by Dr. Dyer. So he talked about broadly three ones. The very first one is autocratic. They say, guys, this is my decision. Follow it either my way or highway. If you don't follow me, you are out. So that's me, the autocratic leadership. Some company runs on that basis around. At the moment, you just if you don't follow the path, you have the results. The democratic is the one who tried to carry the team around, involves the people around for every decision. And the last is the free reign leadership. They don't even bother about anything. They say, guys, you do what you want. So leave most decision to employees around. So that's the last approach around. Now the issues come when we're talking about the leadership part. The management decisions of which we're taking around, the two concerns around. Either you have a concern for getting the job done, or you have a consideration for the people. Two aspects around. In any organization where you're the bosses, you're looking at two components. One, the job has to be done. Second is the human being with whom you're dealing with it. So either consideration, if you become two considerations, you become like a club. But if you're totally focusing on the work, but not about the human being, then it becomes very autocratic. Time. So this is where I think it gives a wonderful figure. Now, on the x-axis, there's a concern for production or output. And the other one is concern for people. And each one is on a scale of one to nine. You can see the team leader, who has a good balancing, a good trade-off between the concern for people and concern for production. Those are the team leader, jet type. Then we have autocratic type whose only concern is about output, output, output. This is what has to be done today. And then concern for people is very less. That's what we call them, autocratic leaders, X type. But then we have benevolent leaders who are only caring for the people and not about anything. So that becomes a club, more like a club that guys, we only have a chat and have fun, but nothing about the output. Last but not the least is the less affair. Again, it's a French word. Those type of less affair leader means they don't get involved in anything. They are basically a media for passing information. They'll just pass on whatever information comes to them. They pass it to the staff and expect them to make all the decisions around. That's what the lesson is. They are not involved on day to day anything. They pass on everything to the staff around. The question comes, which one works for you? Obviously, everybody will see the team leader has proven to be the most effective, but requires a very good balancing act and a genuine concern for people. Now, there are special situations may require other styles. Suri L, uninvolved at all, leave them alone. C's main role is a passer of information. Their job is only to just pass on the information. Let's other make a decision around. Autocratic is the one with lacks flexibility. They don't have any flexibility. They come with a set mind. 
they say this is my way end of it they want controlling they want demanding their carrot and stick approach those who do well they obviously they have a carrot if they don't do well stick is there they follow only two things around i mean these things work sometime even in the armies or other places around but but in today's world when you're dealing with people who are well qualified intelligent people this approach may not work at all focus solely on output the benevolent leaders very people oriented encouraging others around organizes around people can be paternalistic they behave like a parent or whatever and the country club atmosphere not competitive there's no competition at all balance is the production team leader again i said earlier i'm just skipping this so so this is again summarized form if we look at theory l missing management part very low productivity theory x if i go with x type my way or i way the autocratic the job stress goes very high the low satisfaction people started to form unions around and a country club certainly low achievements good people leave and the jet one is when the people are good managers high productivity cooperation low turnover and employee commitment system now when as a manager and a leader you want to make a decision because in your day to day working there are many choices available to you so decision is nothing but making a choice between the various alternatives and when it comes to decision making is a process so decision is picking up x or y or z and making is a process of identifying if i follow this path what are the problems and opportunity if i do this way what are the problems and opportunity and how do i resolve so that's what it called the decision making in a real life nothing is certain so we have different opportunity scenarios around the very first one is certainty that mean all the information for decision making is available to you and this is very certain and these information which we call certain are evolving all the time they are changing nothing is fixed but that in the real life you don't find that situation until you are a monopoly company nobody is competing with you there is no competition at all that's where the certainty comes in demands are changing every day today you plan a customer demand projection oh so many pieces i am going to sell but then you find in a weeks time the business goes down to half the next area is a risk the decision has a clear cut goals the goals are there good information is available and the future outcome which i am going to do with each alternatives are subject to chance so is a big risk uncertainty yes they know very well the managers know which goals they wish to achieve information about alternatives and future even the income and the last one is ambiguity part the most difficult situation is everything is ambiguous i can live with certainty or uncertainty i can do my own calculation but ambiguity means i have no information at all goals to be achieved are the problems to be solved is unclear everything is unclear you don't know about the goals you don't know about the market everything is unclear so in those situation if you have to take a decision naturally this could lead to disaster coming back to the decisions styles now obviously as a manager and a leader when you're making the decisions run the department to run the organizations one could be that you are doing as a directive style second could be the analytical style you all the time analyze information i mean mostly people you will find i mean majority i would say come under this analytical this guy give me this information give me this information and based on the data they try to do it directive means they come with a very clear idea that this is what i want to do it let it happen what the outcome comes analytical people they analyze the information they look at the pros and cons of each and then make a decision conceptuals behavior the behavioral people are the one who only look at irrespective of what are the issues around 
they talk to the people around and what information they get, they take a decision based on that. They basically want to please everybody around. Look at the directive style. Now, people who have preferred simple, clear-cut solutions to problems, they make very quick decisions. They feel this is what I have done for 20 years. This works well, go ahead and do it. May consider only one or two alternatives. They are very fast, efficient, and rational because they don't take time. So sometimes this works very well when you're working in a small niche. You know very well your areas. You know the market around. So that case, you could be very directive. You say, guys, I know we've been doing for the last 10 years. This is what is working well. And they make a very directive type decision. So in the process, this is very efficient, very rational, and they're able to convince from their own objective. Analytical is the one where they want to do you know, everything. Everything has a risk. We all know very well. Every decision has a risk around. But these people are the one who do the analytically. The data they have, and based on the data, they do calculations. And they look at all the possible alternatives. And based on the alternative, they look around which one gives me the best outcome. They make a decision. Come the conceptual style. They have information, but more socially oriented than analytical style. The analytical was purely on analytical, the table type guy. You give him all the information, give him or her the information, they'll make it this. But these people are, they want to talk to the people around. They analyze something, but then they go around, talk to the people. How do you feel about this? Is this the solution best one? I like to talk to others about the problem and possible solution and consider many broad alternatives, rely on information, solves problem, create. So they are taken not only the desk approach, analytical is all desk approach. These people are, okay guys, now this is what my information gives me. I go to the people, talk to them, collectively they come with a creative solution. So that means the problem they solve is more creative way, not just analytical. The behaviors, they are not bothered about analytical. They're only bothered about the individual, how it is going to affect X and Y. Somebody may lose a job. So they are more emotional type and they are going with the more on the behavior side. Say so they talk to the people on one-to-one -one basis. They understand their feelings about the problems. And this is how the decisions are made. Okay, guys, now the next comes the whole chain, what we talked about the decision. So the manager and a, as a leader, when you're trying to make a decision, the very first thing is, first step is recognize what are the issues in your mind. Define the decisions around. Develop the options around. Analyze the options around. And after you analyze the option, you select the best option and then implement the option. And lastly is, I think this is very important for any functions around monitoring the consequences. What is going to be the impact of it? Monitoring it before it becomes too bad. Now, so far we have touched about under the part of management practices. We talked about the management, understanding what is management. The next one we went about the organization, how are you going to manage it? What type of structure you're going to have? The tall structure, the flat structures, the span of controls, what type of it is. Is it a functional type? It is virtual type, whatever we talked about. Then we talked about the employee relationship. Now, this is where I'm going to focus on now. The overview of ER. At the end of the day, in spite of all the best technology, the, the people were going to show the results around. So, employee relation is much broad concern it is one of the most important around because you may have technology you may have anything around but people who are behind this is all persons so i think one need to take care of them they take care of the grievances you have to recognize them you have to boost the morale of the employees to make the working environment more healthy and above all i think that you have to build a work culture and ethics i think the company has to build up your good ethics around, good behavior part, and good culture as well. 
that's also important around. So this is where we, when we try to explain what is employee relationship, it's an ongoing relationship building process. So employee and the supervisor relationship and the great ingredient which goes into this, the very first one is communication, communication, communication. I repeat it three times because to me, the communication is a much more important how you communicate to them and the trust what you behave in that even trust also follows with communication ethics how are you ethical and then how you expect the staff to be ethical around the moral part the fear part the career development part the feelings of each other's the beliefs of each other expectations and if there are conflict how do we resolve them and helping them to grow in their careers around and the leadership part also. How we go into that, helping them to become the good leader as well. People obviously when they work, spend half of their time. I've seen in the US, I've seen in many Asian countries and in my own country now, half the time, what we have 24 hours, 12 hours is spent in the organization with your peers or with your bosses. So that's where when you're spending 12 hours of your time, you have problems also. So you need to listen to employees' concerns and make a sincere effort to resolve the problems. Some companies have come up with the policy manuals. I can understand around those companies which are very big, they have to make the policy manual to ensure a consistent approach, standards of conduct, seek assistance from your operation chain of commands of the HR. And there's no need for employee problem to become a grievance. So before the problem become a grievance, I think this could be resolved around. But there are issues when the problem remains for a longer time, it becomes a grievance. Now, I think you need to treat the grievances of each employee before it becomes a union complaint. Answer the grievance violations with a brief response. And always make reference to the article, whatever is the relevant around. Coming back to the ER functions, I think when you want to create healthy and balanced relationship within the organization, as well as among the employer and employees, I think ER plays a key role around. You want to boost the confidence, you want to improve the moral levels, you want to encourage the employees to give their 100%, I think this plays a key role. And I think one another parameter comes up is treating all employees fairly without any discrimination and favoritism. Because the moment you start doing favoritism or discrimination, I think it leads to problem and ultimately grievances around. To create a healthy and a balanced relationship, to foster the work culture that is live and challenging and dynamic. Now Many companies which are very big, they come up with their own policies around and those policies are communicated to each one, how to deal with this whenever they have issues. So hoping that this will prevent the problem in the workplace from becoming more serious. Now, when we are talking of employees, the staff, whatever, question come all the time, how do we communicate? To them? How do we give feedback to each employee? We have to inform them about their behaviors, how they are, giving a feedback around. Annual performance also, we have to give them the feedback. Even it could be negative or positive, we need to communicate all the time. So when we are doing communication, it means, in short, the definition of it is, it's a process of communication that allows us to interact with people. Communication is, it should not only be just talking around, it is also the purpose should be to allow the encourage the interaction. Without it, I think communication is not complete. So communication is a two-way side. It is not one way. That's what I would call it out. Now, if I had to again introduce in the word into communication, the ability to effectively communicate with one, is the most powerful tool for personal and professional development. Most people are challenged by many day-to-day -day interaction. Emotion counts a lot. Communication also comes into the way. Conflict or present in all human interaction. And to a lot extent, these could be covered through communication. 
if you look around in any organizations, 80% of the problems in the workplace are communication related. How somebody said like this, what tone it was, the way it was communicated. I think the problem starts from that itself. I think this gives a wonderful equation, I would call the communication equation. You can see three parts around. One is hearing, second is seeing, and the last is the words. 50% of the message, what you communicate, is how people see you or feel you. 40% of the message is covered through how they hear you, the tone of your voice, your clarity of the vocal, express the type of language you're using around. So what you're trying to communicate to X and Y person within your own organization, the 40% of the masses come from what they hear, 50% of the masses come what they see and feel. The words are only 10%. So we might be writing a big text around, but those are contributing only 10% of the masses to each one, while the way you explain them, the way you posture it, why the way you do the eye contact, the way you do the touch. And we know, we all know very well when we are in love or hate with someone, you don't need to write words around. Just by looking at somebody's eyes, your face expression, the message is communicated. So you can imagine around the way you see our field, when it works for the love and hate, it also works in the organizations around. So I think that plays an important role. The way you meet your staff, the way you show your gestures around, I think 50% of the message goes from there. The 10% is only the words part. So the word is a very small part. So if I go with the triangle part, you know, somebody has said not even 10% based on the survey with each one. This is words are only contributing 7% of the communication. The tone is contributing 33%, and 60% is coming from your body language. So the body language plays very, very important around how you communicate, even your dress, even your other things around, how you communicate with people that makes a big difference. I think this is another very good slide I would talk around, effective communication skills. If you want to do a good communications, eye contact, don't avoid your eyes. When you're talking to someone, face eye to eye and visible mouth. The body language, your body should also be there. And if required, sometimes you'd be silent also. Checking and for understanding. Smiling face. Summarizing what has been said. I think this goes a long way. And I think we use very often when we do the training part sometimes. After doing every one hour, we try to summarize what we have covered. What is the focus of this? I think when you're communicating for a longer period, even in this webinar, if I'm communicating for one hour, I think I will take every 15 minutes some summarization of what I have covered so far. I think that goes a long way to cement what we have done so far. I think it makes communication much clearer. Next comes, what is training? I'm looking at the staff development. So we started from the structure management. We went to the structure. We went to the leadership style. And after the leadership style, we went around the communication part, the decision-making process. And in the decision-making, how are we communicating? And then we came to the employee relationship. And employee relationship, we made very clear key communication plays a key role. And the particular communication through your body language also goes a long way. And last but not the least is staff development. When we talk about staff development, the training and the development, two components are now. Training is very role oriented. I think this question comes very often around. I'm doing a training program for someone. That means I have identified this guy is doing this function. This guy is doing logistic function. This guy is doing warehousing. This guy is doing inventory management. And this guy is doing only the transportation part. So based on that role, we designed the training program. So again, our focus in training is to build the person or give some extra skill and knowledge. The focus is on skill. While in the development, I'm looking at long term. So when I say development part, it's more of a mentoring also. 
helping the guy in the career to grow further. So it is not just doing training to cover the particular skill which the guy might be lacking. While in the case of development, I have a long-term goal with a particular staff member. I want this guy to grow into this shoes. So in the process, you do the development part. So when we do the development part, normally when we do in the organizations, we try to do before organizing any program, we try to assess the competency. We assess the competency, we do some training, we do some mentoring. So it's a, basically a long term. It is not training where I do one program and end of it, while development part goes for a longer cycle. Now, as explained here, the training is a planned effort by a company to facilitate employees learning a job related competence. So, role I'm doing this role, I'm weak on this, new technology has come, I want to learn this technology. Great. So, these competencies, when we talk around it, could be knowledge of the subject, could be the skills, our behavior critical for successful of a job performance. If I feel one person is dealing with the staff or customers, we find this pie is too rude. So we have to improve the skill of the person, how to become customer friendly, how to communicate with the customers around. So that's a part of the training around. Or if somebody who have been hired for procurement, we know guys, this guy is doing a lot of market intelligence. This guy is doing market research. So we try to give that type of skill, how to do the market research. The goal of training is for employees to master the competencies and apply them on a day-to-day -day activities. My office is trying to implement, let's say, blockchain or trying to implement artificial intelligence, and they will try to give me the training on that subject so that I am competent to do my day-to-day -day activities. But when it comes to training and development part, again, the development focus, the development is not directly related to the job requirement. Rather, it aims at the generic development of the individual employees in the long run. So we are looking as a long-term approach, not a short-term approach. It is not with the skill. I'm trying to build, including the skill, I want to see the long-term, how this person will grow into the long term, bigger functions. Training is mostly provided to teach new skills while development focuses on improving the existing skill. You may have existing skill, but we're trying to help you to improve that part. So this is where I think even our organization, we try to do both activities around training and development part. The process which goes for training is obviously the needs assessment. I know this question comes very often since we do a lot of training program for many companies. First thing comes, guys, okay, do a training program, let's say in the subject like transportation and then Then we try to know around, guys, what is the level of your people around? One size does not fit all. So we need to know, they might be saying my people are 10 years experience, but 10 years experience is nothing to us if their knowledge level is very less. So we need to know their competency level. What type of tasks they are doing around? Are they ready to do for training? Because sometimes there's a behavioral attitude, there's a mental attitude. They say, guys, oh, I've been doing this for 20 years. I don't need any training around. I'm very good at this. So if that mental attitude is there, mental block is there in some of the staff members. So sitting in the training, they will not absorb much about it. So that attitude issue is there around. Creating a learning environment. So it should not be when we talk of a learning, it is not just communicating what you have written down and passing on to the others. So if I were to do the same training the way I'm doing today in the webinar, obviously, because of technology limitations, I'm passing on reading through or informing you what it covers. But if same thing, if I had to do in a proper face to face, we will have a case studies. We will have some games, we will have some exercises, we will have involvement of the participants, which I know I'm lacking in this webinar. So that is very, very important around when we want to create a good learning environment. So we try to create even the community of learning. We have also created from IS in India, the community of learning. We have got COBs, community of practitioners. They learn from each other. 
if I am sitting in Pune or I am sitting in Bangalore, well, see, guys, I've got this request around. Can anybody help me on this? I want to do reverse auction implementation. What type of practical tips I have on? So people can learn from each other. So that's a model which we are trying to do in most of the cities. And I'm very happy to say that many of the cities, our community of practice is doing very active role among themselves, even without our any involvement around me. Ensuring the transfer part, the knowledge, the training part should not be just reading out like a parrot and passing on the information. It should also be the transfer of knowledge. Then we're trying to do is the developing an evaluation plan. Then trying to see that what type of training is suitable. We are done many times. Sometimes we're done face to face. Sometimes we feel this is a very short training program for one hour or two hours. We are done on an e-learning basis. So you can see in our website of ISM India, we have got many e-learning programs around. Many of the senior people, they don't have time, but they know the subject and they need a little quick push on the, and they can do through e-learning. And lastly is monitoring and evaluating the program part. Then we also get feedback from them. Is this the right thing or not? So I think that helps us to continuously improve upon it. Let me give you a snapshot of retaining practices, the way it is happening in the market industries around. Now we have many organizations, learning and development departments around. Obviously the trainings are done and the development is done. L&D department, the learning and development department, they look around what are the needs and they work with the trainers. They work with the managers in-house. They have in-house consultant who work with them on a regular basis. And when the need comes, they invite them, say, guys, can you do something for us to explain this stuff? They have employee experts around. And sometime in some organization I've seen that they feel that this is not our cup of tea. Let's outsource the whole thing. Our job is to develop program. Our job is to do this production. And the whole learning and development, we outsource it. I think it works in some places, but in one way, you don't know the staff, your own employees, what are they expecting? What are the issues behind that? So if you have your own L&D, maybe they know. They become a good bridge between the local staff and an outside person that may work around. Training and development can be the responsibility of professionals and human resources. So the people from HR, HRD, and organization development, they all could put together, come up with this. Well, friend, with this, I want to thank you all. I've tried to cover very in a short verse time the whole chain of management practices which are required by all the managers around to become successful and to become effective. Thank you again for the patient hearing and I wish you all the best. Take care.